welcome to this episode of Sunny Silver Linings. Sunny's guest today is Wes Spencer, angel investor, advisor, and expert on all things cybersecurity. Today, Sunny and Wes chat about how MSPs can win the war on talent, how the industry has changed over the past five years, and lots more. And now, your host, the founder and CEO of IT by Design, Sunny Kayla. Uh, Wes, thank you so much for joining me today. I truly, truly appreciate your time. Sunny, thanks for having me. And let's start with my first question, uh, Wes. My first question is, um, you know, you, you know, you you talked about uh, overall. There's 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 there are a lot of changes. How have things changed over the past five years? That you know, they they've changed drastically. I mean, we've gone through almost light years of change over these five years, and. Um, we don't have the time to go through like the major like phases of changes for MSPs, but a couple of things I would point to, Sonny, that I think we've seen major thing, major shifts is, you know, in the early days, five years ago, six years ago, it was AV and a firewall, antivirus and firewall, and you're good to go. Yeah. And then these breaches start to happen. They start creeping in and really 20, like 16, 2017, they start to st- like really creep in and ransomware attacks go from like $10,000 in damage to $100,000 in damage. And then it gets caught compounded when bad guys figure out that these MSPs are these extremely lucrative targets. And they realize this is a, a coin, a, a term we coined called the Buffalo jump attack, where it goes back to like ancient Native American hunting techniques where, you know, they learned that, a you know, a bone ax and an atlatl is a poor hunting technique. It's easier just to cause a stampede and rush a bunch of Buffalo off a cliff. It's a visceral example but bad guys figured out the MSPs are uh, these buffalo. They, they, they own these herds of buffaloes, right? Like 20, 50, 100 different clients. And if they can leverage the RMM to go after all of these clients and run ransomware in mass, now ransoms go up into the millions. And this is what we saw. And so you see this huge shift into MSPs realizing, whoa, I need to become a security first MSP. It's good for revenue, but it's also that it's the necessary thing to, to do to survive. And then, Sonny, we go through this phase of like, we see rampant attacks all through all through 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021, major news. I mean, you think about like we're seeing stuff covered in CNN, uh, Reuters, Fox News, BBC of these major MSP attacks. And it's it's a headline news item. And now MSPs are center stage in government regulation, in insurance conversations. I mean, it's wild what's happened in four or five years. And then fast forward to where we are today, and you you have leading MSPs that have grasped and embraced cybersecurity that I think are equal to some of the largest Fortune 500s. But you also see negatives where like cyber insurance, and we'll talk about this today, are pulling back. They're seeing loss ratios out of this world and like, whoa, we're not, we're not sure we want to get into this anymore. And so we're in a sense, we're, we're in a stage of upheaval. Some are doing well, some are left behind, and some don't know the path forward in cybersecurity. But I tend to be an optimist and I tend to think, Sonny, there's a lot of opportunity here to do the right thing for the SMBs and to grow our MSPs through uh, cybersecurity. So that's that's kind of the quick recap and what in the world has happened over the past five years. It's been wild. Yeah, and MSPs are getting a lot of uh, attention, even in terms of uh, you know the overall value creation for their businesses, uh, right? When there's an MSP who's doing really, really well in terms of uh, you know security first approach, those companies are a lot more valuable Right, so uh, first they are doing the right thing for the customer as a managed service provider. And as a result of creating that value for the customer in the right area, protecting them and their own uh, company is kind of really growing much faster. They are creating a lot of value. So there's just so much that, that a business can do and business can gain by being more cybersecurity focused. But one question that, I have is before we move into our talent talk is what inspired you early on when there were not too many cybersecurity experts in the channel, what inspired you to get into this field? You know, uh, this goes back, I don't think I've ever shared this with anybody publicly. So I'm going to share it with you for the first time. When I was a little kid, I, I grew up in Florida and then we moved around to a ton of other states, but, and I'm back in Florida now. And when you're driving through these country roads in Florida and you see these forests out there, they have these big, um, 
they call them like fire watchtowers that, mm -hmm. you know, you, you can climb and you look out for fires and these things. When I was a kid, I remember driving down one of these roads and I said to my mom, I was like, mom, I want to be one of those fire guys that like climbs up and looks for fires. I want to be a lookout man. <laughs> and she's like, that's great, Wes. Like, I'm really glad for you. But, you know, I didn't realize that that wasn't a full-time job, but I was like ready to sign up and be the guy that climbed the tower and watched out 24 seven. And I think I've always had this bent towards being someone that like watches out for things and looks out for other people. Like I get a lot of benefit by seeing others intrinsically benefited themselves. And so cybersecurity for me was like a natural thing. I never, I always knew I wanted to do it. I grew up as a kid, very curious in nature and um, you know, I grew up in the 90s when there was no such thing as real security. And so, you know, I spent a lot of time as a high school, as a high schooler breaking into things that I shouldn't have done, um, not really causing significant damages, but just, you know, being curious. And so I knew that cybersecurity by its nature of embracing curiosity and bending rules and doing things that aren't intended was always a lot of fun for me. And then you combine that with like, I just have this like natural bent towards wanting to look out for others and protect others. And so uh, you combine that with SMBs and it's the perfect world. I actually spent um, about three and a half years at a small bank, about a half billion in assets. And I learned right there, then and there is my first like smaller, um, you know, opportunity at a smaller company to realize we're not too big to fail. Like there, there could be a systemic cyber event that happens to us and it shuts us down. I'm not a bank of America. And I really learned to love SMBs through that whole journey of my career. And so going into starting Perch was this natural evolution of how can we help down market? Because down market is going to be, we, we sensed it. It's going to become an, an attack vector like never before. And they don't have the resources. They don't have the capabilities. They don't have the knowledge. Um, and they're much easier targets. And so uh, that really is my evolution of why I love the channel. I love SMBs and I love who the, who the MSBs stand for in that regard. And to think that we have the opportunity, and Sonny, I include you in this, to think that we have the opportunity to move the needle forward mm -hmm. for MSPs means that we are doing exponential good for all of the SMBs they protect. And I can't think of things more noble than that. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, thank you for sharing that. And let's talk about talent uh, now. So what's your advice to MSPs where they're, they're struggling with their cybersecurity workforce plan? They're not able to deliver solutions and things that they want to do for their customers. How can they, how can they win this uh, talent war? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm really glad you asked because I want to unpack that a little bit because I think we really need to start attacking that head on mm -hmm. um, because it's going to become more and more of a problem if we don't address it. And, and the good news is there's things that we can do now that will pay off in dividends in the future. So yeah. um, a few things. One that I want to start with is I believe every MSP, even small ones, are at the point now where they need to have someone focused on cybersecurity for their MSP. Uh, you can't just totally outsource 100% of cybersecurity. You must have someone that owns it that says, we know how to build good security for our MSP because vendors can help you in the process of doing good security and augment some of the human resource gaps you have. But ultimately, someone has to lead the charge and someone has to build the security program and design it and communicate it and own it and make sure that the executive team is moving in the right uh, paces forward. And so I think every organization, every MSP needs to get to the point where they eventually have one FTE devoted to cybersecurity. Now, if you're smaller and you have 20 clients and you're a single owned, you're going to share that responsibility. That's okay. But as you grow, that's going to become necessary. Mm -hmm. But here's where the huge challenge comes from. I, Sonny, I have conversations all the time. I had one with a really good friend out of Texas, very large MSP out of Texas um, a couple weekends ago. And he said, Wes, he goes, I am struggling. I can't find a CISO to run our security program. And I am digging hard. Like, what can I do? And I had some thoughts for him. And I want to share those thoughts with you, Sonny. And I'd love to get your feedback on them. Um, one is, I think what we need to think about is you are, let's recognize that we're competing against Fortune 500s in cybersecurity, mm -hmm. right? I had this experience. I remember hiring my very first cybersecurity analyst at my bank. Um, he was somebody that was relatively unproven and, and he would tell you this and, but he had a lot of it aptitude and hunger for security. And so we said, we're, we're going to build you into the role and we're going to give you the freedom to expand and grow and learn. And we did. And I, he's a good friend of mine to this day, but I remember Sonny, uh, this is the, I, I saw this thing coming. He comes into my office one day, it was a Monday and he's like, Hey Wes, do you think I could take like tomorrow to Thursday off? 
you know, and I'm like, yeah, sure. No problem. That, that sounds good. I'm, you know, it, anything going on? He's like, yeah, I just need to take a couple of days off. I'm like, okay, cool. But inside I'm thinking who like comes in in the, like on a Monday with no prep and asked for three days off in the middle of the week, not even getting a weekend, you know? Mm -hmm. So I knew he was doing an interview. So he gets back and, and I say, Hey, how'd the interview go? And he goes, how'd you know? And I'm like, come on, man. I, I'm not going to say his name right now, but he's like, he's like, come on, man. I said, come on, who, who takes three days off in the middle? And he, he's like, yeah, you're right. Busted. I'm like, well, how'd it go? And he said, it went awesome. They offered me the job and I'm torn. I don't know what to do. I'm like, well, who is it? And he said, New York stock exchange. And I said his name and I said, Hey, let me just tell you something. If you don't take that job, I'm going to fire you so that you can go do the job. And so he's like, are you kidding? I'm like, you must do this. This is good for you. But at the same time, I'm thinking, Oh, here I go. Wes has to rebuild from scratch. And we invested a year into his growth and then off he goes, but I can't blame him. He was making, he's, he made 40% more by going there than what I could afford. Now he had to move all this. So this really kicked me off into, oh no, we've got to be thinking about pipeline, 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 because we have to recognize there will always be some talent that we bring into the organization that just jives with the mission, is the perfect lockstep culture fit. And yet they know they can make 20 to 40 to 80% more going to a bigger company, but they don't want to. And that's great. Those are the ones that you know we just build alongside. But let's recognize that we're going to bring talent in. They're going to spend a year or two and they're going to go on and go elsewhere. And that's okay. Let's, how do I maximize value out of them? Mm -hmm. And so where do we build the pipeline from? A couple of things I think are really helpful. One is think about your local high schools, go get involved in those, the local high schools where you have talent being built, especially those that have good STEM, you know, science, technology, engineering, math, and mm -hmm. get involved in those programs, maybe donate like resources, maybe donate time to them, maybe offer internship programs with zero experience required. And I know these things can be seen as a burden, but what you're doing is you're building a friendly face. You're building the attitude and awareness for those high schoolers to say, I really like that company. I like what they're mm -hmm. doing. And my other friend did this program and he learned a ton of stuff and I want to get involved in that. And then expand that into colleges. I love and highly recommend local community colleges versus like large universities because they're going to be harder to really integrate with. But local community colleges are hungry. For Thanks for listening. Join us next week for part two of Sonny and Wes Spencer's interview. Have a good week.